<laughs> All right, good morning to everybody. Let's, let's uh, look at Genesis chapter 5. In advance, happy Mother's Day, though we will surely mention that again in the service to come. But Genesis chapter 5, 32 verses this morning. Right? Yeah, 32 verses. Um, so all of chapter 5. And so let's, let's, let me begin by quoting this verse and, and then we'll pray and we'll see what the Lord has for us. Uh, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Psalm 119 and verse 18. My hope this morning is that uh, when we take a look at what lies before us that we'll see wondrous things. And that it will strengthen your faith in the Bible so that, um, you know, in times of trial of your faith, which we all have from time to time, that you'll be able to stand firm on the scriptures even when your heart is doubtful within itself. And you will have those days, FYI. Uh, okay, let's, let's pray. Father, help us to, I guess, not only see everything that you'd have us to see this morning, but to believe it, receive it, apply it. And uh, Lord, I, I look forward to showing people the, the hidden treasure found within your word this morning. Uh, it's, a, it's an immense blessing and we give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so verse 1 of chapter 5 says this, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. So, question for you. What is a generation? Let's start there. Define it biblically. Because everyone thinks, so it's a time period, right? What is a generation? It's 40 years. What's a generation? 60 years. What's a generation? 120 years, biblically. No, no, we've got to stop there. A generation is that which has been <coughs> generated. It's a creation. And in particular, it's a people. And let me show you from Scripture. Matthew chapter 11. We've got the references here. We're going to bop, 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 bop down right through them. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 and 17. But whereunto shall I liken this, what? Generation. So this 40 years? Right? Let's look. Everything, look at everything biblically. It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, we have piped unto you and you have not danced, we have mourned unto you and you have not lamented. So not a period of time, but a nation, a people, and in particular who? Israel. Okay, Matthew 12. Look at verse 41. Let will just get a few references here. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this what? Generation. So the men of Nineveh will rise with this 40 years? No, this generation. Come on in, brother. Uh, and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Well, who's that? Who's, who's greater than jo Jonas? The Lord Jesus Christ. And who is Jonas? I had a friend growing up by the name of Jonas. But it's Jonah, right. So again, not a time, but a nation. Do you see it? You know, I just want, we get these ideas from, you know, not from scripture, but just from things that we've heard or just thoughts that we have about what is a generation. Well, a generation's 40 years, biblical generation's 120 years. No, a biblical generation is a people. It's a people. Let me show you again. Matthew 24. And now we'll take the reference that because people always misunderstand what, gen or what generation means, then they run to these verses, these prophetic verses, and start coming up with these ideas about the time of the end and the time of Jacob's trouble. Matthew 24 and verse 32. Jesus says, Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. That's kind of important as well. Brother Tom and I were talking about this. Listen, no man knoweth the day or the hour of the Lord's return. Right? But he's given us some clues in the scripture so that we can kind of get uh, little pictures, little ideas. And when you read the Song of Solomon, I think it's the second chapter where 
he's calling out to his bride and saying, come up, come away with me. That's like him saying, come up hither. It's a type of the rapture. And it even says when, uh, and I think it's the time that the leaves begin to bud. So what is it? That's the end of spring and into summer. It's that season. It follows Pentecost, which has to do with the church, which, by the way, the rapture has to do with the church. Song of Solomon deals with a Gentile bride. Come up, come away with me, right? So um, this, is, this is the time frame, I would say, from Pentecost to the beginning of summer to June is the idea that, you know, when the Lord does return for his church, that it will probably be in this season. A lot is made about September and October because of the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of, yeah, Tabernacles. Um, but that's Jewish. His second advent when he lands on earth will probably be September or October. But when he comes for his church, it's probably going to be around the time of Pentecost, which is, we celebrate, come on in guys, we celebrate, um, and we call it what, Easter, right? We call it Resurrection Sunday, the world calls it Easter. But, so now, learn the parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender, putteth forth his leaves, ye know that summer is nigh, so likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this forty years shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. This is how people look at it. They go, once all of these things that Jesus talked about begin to happen, you've got 40 years and that's it, at best. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the generation of Israel, the people of Israel. They shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Why did he need to teach this? Think about why did he need to teach it? It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, Israel, is going to be thinking, we're going to be wiped off the face of the earth. We're dead. We got the Antichrist chasing us. We refuse to take the mark of the beast. We are done for. And people are going to start thinking, and even nations that are trying to protect them, and there will be a few that will try to protect them, they're going to think, man, we got to do everything we can. Well, let's hope that... Israel isn't destroyed. It won't be. Jesus made the prom promise, this generation shall not pass. So that's, it's not a time period, it's a people, it's Israel. They shall not pass away. Will they be scattered? Absolutely, they still are. They're all over the world. Are they going to be afflicted? Yeah. Hunted like wild animals? Yep. Yep. But they shall remain. They shall remain. That is the Lord's promise. Israel will not depart as much as some people want to do away with it, including church people, which is sad in these last days. Go to Romans 11. Let's show you these verses here. Beware any pastor or teacher that even slightly intimates that the church has replaced Israel. The church has not replaced Israel. Israel didn't need replacing. Romans 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people, referring back to chapter 9 as the Jew, according to the flesh. So not a spiritual Jew, like you know we would call the church, but the Jew-Jew. I say then, the Jew-Jew, Jew-Jew-Bees. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. He's painting the picture right there for you of who he's talking about. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, so he's talking about Isaiah, go, praying to the Lord and going, Lord, your people, so he's praying against them. Your people have done this, and your people have done this. Listen, have you ever been in that place, church, where someone in the church has hurt you so badly that you're on your knees going, Lord, this person of yours. Come on. You have. Come on, if you're honest, more than likely, you probably have, and then you've gotten some feigned sense of spirituality after and went, well, Lord, I pray for their betterment, of course, and that they would, you know, but what you're thinking is, Lord, get them. <laughs> That's what you're thinking, and you can't hide that from the Lord, right? 
But that's what Elias was doing. I said, I said Isaiah, uh, Elijah did that. Verse 3, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars. This was the prayer that Elijah was making. And I am left alone and they seek my life. And remember, he was in the cave, right? And he was whining and crying and the Lord called him, called him out on it. And verse 4, but what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Yeah. Verse 5, even so then at this present time also, there is a what? What's that word? Remnant according to the election of grace. We're not going to go into the details of that for this morning, but that is how you interpret the, the parable that Jesus spoke of with the fig tree. We're talking about a people. They will not pass away. He has reserved a remnant. By the way, the church is apostate in these last days. There's a great falling away. Second Thessalonians talks about it. Well, what are, what are you going to expect? Are you going to expect you know, Joel Osteen's 15,000 member church to be the church? No, you're going to have little pockets of, of remnants. You're going to have an Elijah who thinks he's alone in it all, and then God is going to answer some prayer of his and remind him, hey, you know what? I got a little church over there in Buffalo. There's a little church over there in Tonawanda. There's a little church over there in Cheektowaga. You know, and I've just, I've reserved. It's okay. I know that this is hard. I know it feels like you're alone, but you are not alone. Amen. Draw some comfort and some strength in that. They've not bowed the knee to Baal. Don't you bow the knee to Baal. Just keep on keeping on. It's okay. I'll be back soon. Amen. Right? So that's, that's it. And that's, again, how you interpret it. You compare Scripture with Scripture and let the Scripture define words. Now, back to Genesis. Chapter 5. And verse 2. <laughs> Wendy and I were having a very good conversation about this yesterday. Male and female created he them. Let's just stop. How many? How many did this? She was looking this up. How many genders do they say exist? 63 genders. 63 genders. That was on CBS? CBS was promoting 63 genders. It's not. The people of CBS are insane. Just so you know, little man. Right? There are two, male and female, created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. So Adam and Eve were called what? Adam. Now Adam named Eve Eve, which Eve means what? Mother of all living. That's what that means. So he named her, I mean, who knows how long he was in a relationship with her, married to her, of course, before he decided to start calling her Eve. They were always one unit together, Adam. When God said, Adam, they both came. Wendy and Seth are called Koenig. Tom and Debbie are called DiPerno. Megan and Ethan are called Schwartz. <laughs> Close. <laughs> Close. <laughs> That's okay. I get Koenig all the time, brother. So my mother in law calls me Koenig. She doesn't even know my name. So, but here's where it began. Began what began? A wife taking her husband's name. Yeah. It began in the beginning, and it began with God. And that is why in these last days it is attempted to be overturned. So, I'm just saying, you know, anything that God sanctioned or ordained, man is going to try to put an end to. Why? Will it matter in anything is in regards to even salvation, heaven or hell, eternity? No, it's just that man is spiteful. Proof of that was yesterday when we were doing the street ministry. And those, you know, young man came up to mock. You know, held up a sign pretending to be born again and while his friend was taking pictures and laughing. You know, and, and when I confronted his friend, of course, he, he said, well, I didn't think he would do it. You know, but, you know, I mean, that's just, why do that? So you don't believe what we believe. Do you go up to the person who has the sandwich sign that says mattresses half off? 
and go, can I stand here? I'm a mattress salesman too. Right? No. Why, why do that? Because man's just spiteful when it comes to God. That's what it is. And, and you know, I mean, hey, God's going to have the last laugh. He'll have them in derision. Read Psalm chapter 2. And, uh, for, you know, we got to have a different heart, though. I was talking to the guys, you know, what I should have done, it's always retrospect, right, after the situation. I should have said, young men, come on, let's go have lunch, my treat. And just talk to them. Because maybe nobody has ever sat down and actually shared Jesus with them. And I think, if listen, if we're going to lead anyone to Christ in these last days, we've got to change our attitude. We can't show the same disdain for them that they show for us. We have to turn that thing around and we have to weep for them and pray for them and show them Christ. Verses 3, 4, and 5. And Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years and he begat sons and daughters. It's a lot of time to beget sons and daughters. 800 years. Whoo! And all the days. Imagine that. You read about these guys in the Bible that lived 80 years and they got like 40 children. 800 years. Poor Eve. <laughs> Verse 5. All the days of Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Okay, so before we get to uh, this special nugget that's hidden in the text. Let's deal with uh, this fact um, that the number five, and we've talked about this in our biblical numerology series, the number five is associated with death in the scripture. Where the number five turns up, you are often going to find death around it. You say, why is that? I don't know why he chose five uh, other than, you know, Five bleeding wounds he bears. One, two, three, four, five. And he did what for us? I mean, just this, he's showing us, but, you know, why it was five. I don't know why it was five. But the great thing about biblical numerology is that you can't really deny it. When you see how he uses numbers, he uses them in such a specific way that it makes you go, Wow! Look what he did with this book. So the number five is associated with death. Death will follow Adam the way stink follows a corpse. Three words are going to appear after every single person in this line. And he died. It is our greatest enemy. Death is man's greatest enemy. It has been since this time. And why is death upon us? For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it doesn't have to end with death. By the way, Genesis ends with a, a coffin in Egypt. It began in a garden with life. But because of man's sin, the last chapter, chapter 50, ends with a coffin in Egypt. That's man's history. But by the end of the book, all the way in the book of Revelation, it ends back where? In the garden with life. So God will fix it, and he fixed it with this. That's how he fixed it. Uh, go to Romans chapter 5. Just to give us a couple verses here on this subject matter. We've got to move along because I'm just yapping away. Romans 5. By the way, what a blessing. Our Sunday school used to have like 10 people in it. What a blessing. Uh, Romans 5, verse 12 and 13. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, because Adam sinned. For that all have sinned, right? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we have this nature in us, and it's through Adam. But the verse is very clear. 
We are all responsible to choose to rise above our natural inclinations to sin and fight that natural man with a spiritual man. That's why you must be born again. You've got no hope at fighting the sin problem without the Holy Spirit of God indwelling you. Verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Well, now there's an interesting word, imputed. What does anyone know what imputed means? Pardon me? Counted. Numbered. Accumulated. It's, it's, it would be a finance term. I think it's still used in finance. It's reckoned. Reckoned. So that's why the law is a curse. So why? Because all it does is tell you you've sinned. It keeps account. You broke this law. You broke this law. You broke this law. One after the other after the other. And all man can ever think to do is, well, I didn't break this one though. The law doesn't care what you didn't break. The law only cares what you did break. And it keeps account of that. That's how the Lord set this thing up. So the law is a curse because it can't help you. It can never be a savior. You need a savior and that person is Jesus Christ. It's not a law, it's a person. Uh, and that blessing of, uh, uh, of grace is found by faith, not in law, right? So it, and there's another imputation, keep your place in Romans 5, but there's another imputation then that can, another accounting that can be reckoned to your estate. In Romans chapter 4, look at verses 22 through 24. Referring to the faith of Abraham, and therefore it was, there's the word again, imputed to him for righteousness. What was, why was it counted to him as righteousness? What? What did he do? He had faith. And his faith in God, not his faith in his faith and not his faith in himself, as humanity teaches, but his faith in his God, God looked at him and says, I am going to now reckon in your account your righteousness. Abraham's righteous. Why? Because he walked little old ladies across the street? No, he believes in me. So God counts that. Um, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, verse 24, but for us also, praise the Lord, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So if you put your faith in the God of Abraham through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, so I can't get to the Father through faith without him. But if I'll go through Jesus, through that cross, through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, put my faith in the God who created everything and his son, he will impute to me, reckon to me, his righteousness. Not by works of righteousness which I have done, but according to his mercy he saved me by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So praise the Lord for that. Back to Romans 5 and verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Meaning, even though the law wasn't there, death still reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him to come. Meaning, the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter, what's this verse saying? It doesn't matter if you've sinned like Adam. It doesn't matter if you've sinned like Mother Teresa, who, by the way, sinned. It right. doesn't matter if you've sinned like Mary, who sinned. Right. Or if you've sinned like Adolf Hitler, who really sinned. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, James 2.10 says, he is guilty of all. To, well, I've never done that. doesn't matter that you didn't do that. You did this. And according to James 2.10, you break one little jot or tittle of the law, he's going to count the whole law against you. And that's why he can rightly say that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, even though you didn't sin like Adam sinned, or you didn't sin like Adolf sinned, or you didn't sin like your brothers or sisters sinned. doesn't matter. You've sinned, and if you've broken one thing, he says, you've done it all. 
say, well, that's, he's an austere man. That's hard. That's harsh. He's austere, right? And he's, that means severe. But he's also gracious. So though you've sinned and come short of the glory of God and he's counting the whole law against you, though you've not been righteous enough to keep the whole law and his son has, he's going to impute his son's righteousness unto you if you'll just trust him. So you can complain all you want about his harshness, but his love is even more abounding. Amen. So from what remains now, uh, we, <laughs> in Genesis, we typically speed read to take it off of our daily list. Come on, I'm not the only one, right? And he begat he and he began he. Well, come on, let's, let's, this is how we read this, right? Uh, verse, and Adam lived 100 years, and son of sons of daughter Seth, and Adam, and Seth, and, and Adam lived 900 years, Seth, he begat Enos, and okay, let me just, Enos begat uh, Canaan, Canaan begat, okay, yeah, yeah, all right, uh, and down to the and, and Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, I got chapter 5 done today. Come on! Be honest. So now look at the last verse, 32, so I'll spare you some time here. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, the lineage ends here. It just stops, even though we know that Shem, Ham, and Japheth will have children, correct? Yeah. Um, and he's going to begin to talk about, you know, the problem that was in the earth and then the flood will come and all that stuff. So there's a, But there's a, there's a reason why he stops here. Number one, because everything would both end and begin again with Noah and his three sons. This, everything was going to come to an end. In fact, we, and if, if you haven't ever looked at this, so this, is, uh, this is exactly how everything spread abroad after the flood. You got the Hamites, and you can read about it in the Bible. They settled down into Egypt and down into Ethiopia. This is the land of Ham. It's Africa. Uh, the Shemites settled from the Middle East out towards the east, and they settled Asia. And the Japhethites settled right around here and then spread west out into Europe. And of course, everyone from these three locations shed up, shot out. So, I mean, you can go in America, you've got Shemites and Hamites and Japhethites all over the place. And America's the great melting pot, but it's not just America anymore. Anywhere you go, you've got all of these races all, and now all mixed together, right? Um, so, number one, this, he, he ends here because this is going to happen, and he wants to let you know what's going to happen. Number two, as I've tried to teach for, what, nearly 11 years now, God doesn't write accidentally. Words mean things. Something begins and stops here for a reason. Um, and I've, I've shared this with you, and even a little bit this morning. You know, I mean, our faith is so, it's so imperfect. You know, one death and our faith is rocked. You know, I mean, here, we're so comfortable in America, it's not even that. Someone cut me off this morning and my faith is rocked. I wonder if God even exists. I can't believe that person did that to me. You know, we're just so easily afraid. <laughs> so, uh, my faith is not perfect, even as a pastor. There are plenty of attacks, and I'll, as a pastor, I won't let you know, lots of mind attacks. You know, am I wasting my life here? Did I just waste 11 years of my life? Things like that come into my mind. I wish they didn't, you know, but they do. And when it all comes right back down to it, it's not, it's not even my trust in Jesus that keeps me grounded. It's the book. Because I know how it's written. I've read it enough times to know this can't be man. Man could not have done this. He wouldn't have thought to do all the wonders that are found in this book. Um, and so we walk by faith, not by sight, but it is an imperfect faith. Yeah. 
and when our faith takes a blow from time to time and situations happen, I've got the wonder that is God's word to remind me that my faith in Christ is real. Christ is real because the book is real. And my Savior, if my Savior's real, man, he's going to get me through anything that comes, comes my way. Though after skin, my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Amen. And I can have that, that faith that Job had, not because my faith is so perfect that I, no matter what happens to me, it is well with my soul. No, it's because, man, this book. Amen. This book. Amen. Can't be man. Right. So... Here's what I'm going to show you for this morning, and we're going, to, we're going to let you chew on this. You can't see it. promise you it's there. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to go down through the lineage, and I'm going to tell you what each of their names mean. Okay? Adam means man. Seth means appointed, anointed, or chosen. Enos means, it, it comes from the root word anash, and it means incurable an incurable wound it would be a mort mortality mortality Canaan means sorrow Mahalalel say that five times fast Mahalalel Mahalalel yes means blessed and L after that means remember that from last week what does L at the end or the beginning of a name mean God Elijah God something to follow or if it ends with an L, Ezekiel means God at the end, okay? So Mahalaliel means blessed God. Jared means, it comes from the root Yarad, and it means shall come down or shall drop, shall descend. Enoch means, it's got a kind of a dual meaning. It means a commencement, but if you know anything about commencements, it has to do with teaching. And when you associate the name Enoch in the scripture, it's with preaching. Read the book of Jude. Okay? So teaching, preaching, commencement. Methuselah, two parts to his word, muff, meaning death, and selah, meaning it's not just a musical note, it also means to bring forth, to shoot forth like a dart, like you'd throw something. Uh, Lamech, Interesting because it's of unknown origin. The only thing that we have is its um, root word, lam, L-A-M. Does anyone know what lamentations means? Sorrow, Sorrow. yes, uh, to lament. And then Noah means rest. So now, man appointed mortal dwelling, the mighty God shall come down, beginning to preach, his death shall bring forth the despairing and rest. Those are, the name, those are all the names put together. So what I did for you was just added a couple words, and here's what you get. Man is appointed mortal dwelling. That means the grave. He's appointed death. But the mighty God shall come down, beginning to preach that his death shall bring to the despairing rest. Amen. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's Jesus, Matthew 11 and verse 28. So right there in the he begat, he begat, he begat, uh, is this hidden gem Amen. that literally the names all point to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, well, that just proves that the Bible was fake and that it's a fake history. Right. Yeah, because Moses or whoever then wrote Genesis, which would be about 1,500 years removed from the book of Matthew, by the way, because they all got together and everyone decided to talk about this guy that would die on a cross before he died on a cross. This was written by God. It is the word of the living God and that's why it's the living book. Quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. So you've got quite a book here in front of you. Now... Um, this, my friends, is why my faith is stronger than my circumstances. Amen. It's not because I have perfect faith, it's because the Bible's perfect. And this stuff can't be a coincidence. It's simply not possible. You've got the heart of the gospel found in the lineage of fallen man. 
in his messianic line, by the way. Because it wasn't Cain's line that we saw that. It was the Lord's line that we saw that. The Lord has been attempting to reach man for thousands of years. And he's attempted to reach man. Man doesn't understand this, but he has attempted to reach man by words. You know, man's looking for the skies to part, and he's looking for signs, and he's looking for wonders. That is not how God is communicating to us. He is using words, written and spoken since the beginning. 1 Corinthians 1.21, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching, by the foolishness of Enoch, to save them that believe. So it is, it, is it any wonder then that Satan has been attacking those words since the beginning? Yea, hath God said. His first attack right in the garden. Adam and Eve, he got Eve by making her doubt what God had promised. And is it any wonder why these last days apostate church people have no interest in the words of God? Reading every book under the sun about the Word of God and about their best life and everything else, but never reading the Bible. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, 2 Timothy 4.3. And as we read in Isaiah 30 and verse 10, prophesy not unto us right things, preacher. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. And all the time you get these people coming up to the pastor and going, I think you're too rough. Prophesy unto us smooth things. All the way back in Isaiah, they're saying that they said that to Isaiah. They're saying it to modern preachers who stick to the book. Would you please stop being so rough? We want you to be like a smooth stone. We don't want to offend anybody. So, it's all about words. It's all about words, and words are the greatest offender there are. Spoken and written, and that's why they're trying to do away with it. Don't preach this way. Don't say those things. That's hate speech. Do not preach from that hateful book. Close that book up. We don't want it. Why aren't you saying that about, you know, Confucius? Why aren't you trying to get rid of him from the schools? What's, what, you love Nostradamus, you talk about him, man get, didn't get one prophecy, right? But that's okay. Book of Allah, keep, keep talking. Buddha says, oh, read your Chinese fortune cookie. Just don't talk about the Bible. We got a problem with that book. And that's just proof that it's true. All right, Father... Thank you uh, for time in your book. I do pray in the service to come, Lord God, that um, yes, the mothers would be honored, but that most importantly, that we would get the priority straight, Lord God, and that you would be glorified as the head of the body to the church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.